Hello, welcome once again. I'm Imran Garda and you're in the stream. Today, fighting for government transparency and accountability. We'll speak to former Minnesota Governor Jesse Ventura. Here in the studio, our digital producer, Ahmed Shehabuddin, is, as always, looking out for your live feedback. And joining him on the couch is Moa Mer, a Palestinian-American comedian best known for his stand-up in the Muslim comedy tour, Allah Made Me Funny. Mo, good to have you here on the couch. Great to have This is an amazing couch. Oh, good? This is, uh, it has its own we've Twitter had some, account. We've, we've had some stick about the couch in the past. So have it's you? good that you've given us I an love endorsement. It. I love orange lollipops, so this is perfect. <laughs> Don't lick the couch. <laughs> no, I will not lick the couch. That's not in my forte. No. Tell us a little bit about uh, some of the comedy you do and uh, some of your travels and travails. Um, well, I've been lucky enough to almost performed in almost 20, uh, 30 countries, excuse me. I've actually performed for U.S. troops also, so that was really interesting. I actually was in Iraq, 30 kilometers away from the Iranian border, and I went up on stage and they advertised me as Mo Ammer. So the first thing I said was like, hey guys, I just want to let you know, my name is Mo, but it's actually short for Muhammad. Surprise! Today's the day! You know? <laughs> and it wasn't, it was really terrifying for about 30 seconds, but they laughed, they enjoyed it, it was hilarious. We had a great time. Um, you know, I've had a lot of different experiences. Okay, looking forward to your thoughts on the program, in the main show and uh, the post show, and feel free to uh, um, give our guest yes. any of your own questions as I well. can't wait. Good, good. Well, of course, this uh, show is all about you, our community, so if you have a story you want to share, tweet it to us with the hashtag AJStream. And before we get into our main discussion, here's Ahmed with all of your feedback. Thank you, Imran. Many people are tweeting with the hashtag FreeRazan to demand the release of a Syrian blogger and dozens more who have been detained in recent months, according to Reporters Without Borders. Now, just days before the Syrian-American blogger and activist Razan Ghazawi was arrested on Sunday at the Jordan-Syria border, she had instructed her friends to close her online accounts in the event of her arrest. Ghazawi was reportedly arrested on her way to Amman, where she was planning on attending a conference on media freedom in the Arab world. Now, TechSoc on Twitter writes this, saying, In planning for her arrest, Red Razan, that's her name on Twitter, protected her friends. She can't give them, the government of Syria, presumably, the passwords they might torture her for. Now, Ghazawi runs her own blog and contributes to Global Voices Online, an international community of bloggers and citizen journalists. And in an ill-fated conversation on Twitter just two days before her arrest, Razan wrote this. She said, do you know one tweet who's been detained because of her or his tweets? And then at the top right there, if you're detained, they, meaning the government, requests your Facebook and email passwords. Twitter is not even mentioned. Now, with foreign journalists barred from covering Syrian protests in the country, the world has come to rely on bloggers to get the word out. This is Razan's blog. In her latest post on her blog, she uh, writes on December 1st about celebrating the release of Syrian blogger Hussein Gharir, who was held by the Syrian authority for 37 days. Now, Razan is among a minority of bloggers who actually use their real name in Syria. And Anas Katish, another Syrian, said on Twitter of Razan, Razan inspired me not to be afraid of using my real name online when I was in Syria. Her courage is incredible. So if you have a story similar to this or a follow-up to this story, you can tweet it to us, as always, using the hashtag AJStream. Hi, this is Morgan Intaka. I'm a guitarist living in Washington, D.C., touring with Wusi Mashasela, and I'm in the stream. Now, our next guest is well known as an advocate for government transparency, as well as bringing to light conspiracy theories in the United States. Of course, we're talking about Jesse Ventura, the former governor of the U.S. state of Minnesota. His diverse career has included stints as a professional wrestler, actor, and Harvard University fellow. He's the author of the book American Conspiracies and 63 Documents the Government Doesn't Want You to Read. And is joining us from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Jesse, welcome to the stream. Nice to have you on the program. Now, a, a federal judge has thrown out your, your lawsuit against the TSA. Those are the guys that do a security check on all of us when we have to, to travel at the airports. Um, you're angry about it. Remind us about what your problem was in the first place with the TSA. 
Well, my problem, and let me also add the one thing that was left off my resume, I'm a former U.S. Navy veteran who uh, spent six years in the United States Navy honorably discharged. So I speak from a veteran perspective of having taken an oath to defend the Constitution and the Bill of Rights of the United States of America against all foes, foreign and domestic. Now, having said that, what happened to me was uh, in 2008, I had hip surgery to where metal was put in my body so that every time I go to an airport from that point on, the metal detector will go off because the metal is inside me. And so there's nothing I can do about it. Well, last summer I was doing my TV show and probably flying four times a week. And every time I'd set the metal detector off and then they were just wanding you at that time. But as the summer wore on, I kept getting angrier and angrier and I couldn't figure out why. And then it finally hit me that getting searched was becoming an everyday thing for me. It was becoming like brushing my teeth, like uh, working out, like sleeping and eating. It was becoming a regular thing in my life and I was getting comfortable with it. And I don't think in what's supposed to be a free country, you should ever, ever be comfortable being searched. Mm -hmm. Well, then fall came along and they went now from the metal detector, they increased it to this pat down, which if it were done on the street, it would be a sexual assault or you're forced to go in this x-ray machine, which they claim is safe. Well. I had it done the pat down once. I immediately came home to my attorneys and I said, I want to file a lawsuit. I want them to stop. The Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, the key word is reasonable. Reasonable search and seizure. And I contend that it is not reasonable to believe that Jesse Ventura, honorably discharged Navy veteran, mayor, governor, and 30-year flyer who has flown for his entire career poses a threat. Interesting and that it you begs the big sorry. Interesting that you mentioned the word reasonable because, um, in light of what happened on 9/11 10 years ago, um, Richard Reed's plot, Omar Farouk Abdul Muttalib, uh, uh, the Nigerian who was in in Yemen and he had the underwear bombing plot. In light of all of that, do you think that there are ever reasonable conditions for searching people? Do you believe in profiling in in any way? I believe in probable cause and I believe profiling is actually a tool that you have to use. If someone robs the bank and they have white skin, you must describe them as being Caucasian. You know, that those are things that are done in good police work and solving terrorism is not going to be done by the military. I exposed that in my last book, 63 documents the government doesn't want you to read. The RAND Corporation did a huge study, and now normally our government listens to the RAND Corporation as if it were the Bible or the Koran. And the RAND Corporation came out and said the use of the military is only has a 7% success rate mm -hmm. against terrorism. What works is police work and intelligence gathering. I'm all for that because why should regular people be treated like terrorists when a one size fits all? I mean, and then it begs the bigger question. Since the airlines are private sector industry, why is it the government's job to provide security for them? Right. Shouldn't they provide their own security? Since uh, just before we get back into some get into some of the feedback from the community, since you said that it is one size fits all, the TSA for those who do take offense, the TSA is a, an equal opportunity offender, if you like, from politicians to celebrities to the plumber. No, they're not. So I, no, I mean, everybody not. has to go through it, don't they? Why do you think no, there's not? Don't. Why do you think there's not been this kind of popular uprising against the TSA? Because everybody doesn't have to go through it. If you can go through the metal detector and you don't have any metal, you go on from there. Uh, John Boehner, the Speaker of the House, he is not required to submit himself. And I ask you, John Boehner did seven weeks in the United States Navy, I believe, 
and was discharged because of a bad back while well, boot camps 11 weeks. I did six years in the United States Navy. If John Boehner isn't subjected to it, why should Jesse Ventura be subjected to it? And they haven't caught anybody. Okay. Jesse, I just was going to get in there and say that we asked our community what they thought about, you know, the TSA. TSA. And it seems that everyone pretty much agrees with you. And just to sum it up, we have one tweet from Occupy and C77 saying, TSA pat-downs are unnecessary, ineffective, and invasive. The only person who tried to perhaps challenge your points is Jeremy Standen, who says, Jesse may be unusual, but he is right on this one. Good for you, Jesse. And we also had a question that came in. Uh, you know, on uh, a video question for you. So let's take a listen. Hi, thanks for taking my question. So, Mr. Ventura, why do you think Americans are reluctant to criticize or ask questions to their government about their foreign policy? Is it that they purposely veil themselves from the truth or they are just afraid? It's a question from a Cameroonian living in Cyprus. I think it's a combination of many of those things. You know, I got banned from Fox TV pretty much because I came out and said that, uh, that uh, why would the United States be surprised that they were attacked by terrorists when we've been practicing it for over 50 years? Hmm. And the person at Fox TV got all indignant and said, well, how can you say that? Give me an example. I said, well, how about the country of Cuba? I said, Cuba's done nothing to us. Yet we've had an embargo against Cuba, we've blown up ships in their harbor, we've attempted to assassinate their president on multiple occasions. The point is, we simply call it foreign policy. Plus, you have a mindset in this country, a belief that our government can't be evil. And people need to understand clearly, governments are made up of people. People can be evil. If you don't believe it, go talk to the German people back in the 1930s. I think they would agree uh -huh. that governments can become evil. It's our job as citizens to be diligent and not to allow that to happen and not to allow to have our freedoms taken away so that we do turn fascist is what I call us today because corporations are running this country today, not the elected officials. Okay, let's bring Mo in. I absolutely, uh, first of all, I wanted to make a comment about the TSA uh, organization. Just constantly, I deal with them on a regular basis, on a weekly basis. And, you know, there's nothing more frustrating than when you see an 85-year-old woman sitting in a wheelchair and they're taking away her insure. You know, this beverage that she really needs for her. She literally, she's sitting there going, well, I need that for my digestive purposes. And they're like, I'm sorry, ma'am, you can't take it. And she's just an 85-year-old woman just trying to travel, just trying to make it easy as how, possible on herself. How, and she can't even do that. You know? how, how about the old woman that was 95 and they took her to Penn's? Oh, And my she God. didn't have any more. So she had to go through the whole flight with no depends on. Yeah. Jesse, I, I just want to say, you were saying that you know, our uh, go government or our country isn't run by the government, it's run by corporations. Mm -hmm. um, but elected officials do come from a two-party system. And we have a question on that note from Jack Hutton saying, uh, ask Jesse Ventura if this is the year a viable third party will compete in the 2012 election. Would you support a third party and whom? Well, I absolutely I would because I don't vote for Democrats or Republicans. I haven't my entire adult life. Uh, although I don't necessarily, I now advocate the abolishment of political parties because we were warned by John Adams, one of our founding fathers, that the country would, if this country fell, it wouldn't come from a force outside, it would come from within. And he even stated what it would be. He said it would be when political parties take over the government because political parties put their party first and the country second. You can't even see differences between Democrats. I can't tell right now any difference between when George Bush was president or since Barack Obama has become president. It's the same thing. We're still in the wars. They haven't closed Gitmo. They haven't given us habeas corpus back in this country. And they're still assaulting our Bill of Rights. And like my book said last year, a year ago, they classified 16 million documents top secret that we can't read. Mm -hmm. Now, getting back to the election, there's only one candidate 
that I see out there, and he'll have to leave the Republican Party for me to vote for him. But I said that if he would leave the Republican Party and go as the Libertarian candidate or any other thing, I would give serious consideration to running with him, and that is Ron Paul. Mm -hmm. Jesse, mm. Uh, in something that's almost symptomatic of um, this anger towards government and, and the big corporations, we've seen this Occupy Wall Street movement and the various occupations throughout the country. You've endorsed them and you've shown their, your support for them. And arguably, they're not too different from those from among the Tea Party who also had economic grievances and, and took to the streets uh, mainly last year and, and the year before. This perhaps could be rooted in the same thing. Do you think that these popular uprisings of disillusioned people with their government, do you think that they can make any sort of difference in this election coming up in 2012, which is in 11 months' time? I don't know, but the thing that always gives me hope is this. I'm old enough, I'm a Vietnam veteran. And I remember in Vietnam when the protests started out against the war in Vietnam and public sentiment and the American media was against those demonstrations. They were saying America, love it or leave it and all these cliches. Well, in the end, the protesters were correct. The protesters were right. And no one can deny that today, mm -hmm. at least not in good conscience, can they? Well, that's my view of these. These protesters are ultimately correct, but they're going to have to fight a battle. And I hope, I dearly hope, that it doesn't end up like the Vietnam protesters because many people militarily feel like the turn of that war was the Tet Offensive of 68. But I truly believe the turn of the Vietnam War in America was when the four innocent college students were gunned down on the campus of Kent State University in Ohio. That turned public sentiment. That changed it all when their children were being shot down in the streets of America. And I surely hope that it does not have to get to something like that to allow these demonstrators to simply exercise their First Amendment rights. Whether you agree with them or not, they have the right to protest their government, and that's a constitutional right that they cannot allow little local ordinances to be more powerful than the First Amendment of the Constitution. But it seems it's that way because they're allowing the, the Gestapo stormtroopers to come in and run them off mm -hmm. over some little, you can't pitch tents in a park. J J that takes priority over the First Amendment. Right, yeah. okay. Mo, Mo, come in with a comment before Ahmed uh, uh, gives us a video question. I mean, for me, it's like, you know, I, I can't see the difference either. I can't see the difference between Democrats or Republicans. I don't see it at all. I wish that uh, there was a bigger platform for independent candidates. I wish I, I think the social media is actually going to even up the playing field a little bit. And I wish we had more of that. You know, I wish I had more independent candidates that we could look at. You know, to a certain extent, both those points, uh, you know, that you both made uh, bring us to the issue of accountability and governance, which I think a lot of people are questioning. Mente Zaude sent us uh, a question via video on the issue of transparency and accountability. Let's take a listen. My question to Mr. Um, Jesse Ventura is that how do you define transparency and accountability in relation to uh, a state secrecy or a confidentiality. So for example, WikiLeaks did a lot to expose in the past year, two years, you know, state secrecy. You think that's productive? I mean, is that helpful? I think it's great because I believe it was one of our forefathers, uh, give me liberty or give me death. Who said that again? I can't remember off the top of my head. He also had a quote stating that you have to have transparency of your leaders because if your leaders aren't transparent you can never live in freedom basically and I'm, I'm just throwing that into what his thought process was I wish I had my book here because I quoted it on the back cover it, flap of my of my last book it's Patrick Henry I think from Patrick Henry from, and if you can read it I don't know if you have the book read it because it says exactly what you're talking about. And so th those, those creators of our great country, they were not stupid men. They knew the pitfalls. They knew what it was going to take to create a country different than all others. Jesse, forgive and unfortunately, 
for, for, sorry, forgive Go me ahead. for cutting you off, but we have a really poignant point coming in from Francois Xavier, who the first gentleman with the video question. He's saying if we're going to criticize the TSA, we should be able to offer solutions or alternatives. So what are yours? My all, all, all uh, solutions and alternative are first, let's get a real investigation of 9-11 and find out what truly happened that day and who truly was behind it. But I, I think he means Because I, I have a lot of weight, and that's what put us in this whole lockdown mode. Mm. And the point is, you're going to catch terrorists with good police work, good intelligence. The RAND Corporation stated that unequivocally and locking down America. I remember George Bush stated that we were attacked because they were jealous of our freedoms, correct? <laughs> right. Well, okay, well, if that's true, then the way we're defending it today is we're gonna take away our freedoms, therefore then they won't be jealous of our freedoms anymore, and they won't attack us because we won't be free and there'll be no jealousy. Let's remember something, Benjamin Franklin said, those that will give up their security, their liberty for security, let me repeat that, those that will give up their liberty for security shall have and deserve neither, because a government cannot make you safe and let you be free. That's an oxymoron. Jesse, uh, don't you think that perhaps by using words like evil, fascism, tyranny, you might inadvertently be marginalizing some people who may sympathize with your cause, who may think that perhaps you're overreacting a little bit here. Well, to me, you can't overreact when you've taken an oath to protect the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. And let me tell you what inspires me. I am inspired from 1968 in the Olympics, when two Olympic African-Americans won the gold medal and the bronze medal, Tommy Smith and John Carlos. They then did something that was so unpopular, they were villains for decades. What they did on that, uh, on that medal stand, they bowed their heads, they raised black gloves in the air when the national anthem was played. Why? Because they were winning medals for a country that wouldn't even give them human rights or civil rights to where in the South they were not allowed to drink at a white mm -hmm. drinking fountain. Well, that required some drastic measures yeah. to bring that attention and change that. Okay. So and sometimes Adelie, you have to do things okay. like that. And Adelie, Adelie, right? I'm not going to go to Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. Mo, Jesse, I'm going to interrupt you there. Mm. I want to uh, get you both to hold your mm. thoughts because we want to get to another section very quickly. We'll continue this discussion in uh, the post show. Um, Ahmed, give us uh, an idea as to some of the stream leads that we're covering. Yeah, so thanks, Imran. The whole point of uh, the lead section is to give you a taste of some of the other stories we're following in the stream. And the first one today is from Russia's parliamentary elections, which has come. And the new crowdsourced map that shows 5,000 reports of election violations across the country. Now, Russia's only independent election monitoring organization, Golosh, which is funded by the U.S. and European organizations, launched the map, which has since been taken down by hackers. Now for our next lead, uh, the Red Cross is looking into whether realistic war video games should be bound by international laws such as the Geneva and Hague Conventions. If the laws are found to apply, they could ask game developers to adhere to the laws or even petition governments to regulate war video games. And last but not least, Veena Malik, a Pakistani actress, posed nude for an Indian magazine with the initials of Pakistan's intelligence agency, ISI, on her arms. Now this caused outrage, as one might expect in India and Pakistan, although she claims that the nude photo was meant to poke fun at the Indian fear of Pakistani spies. And she also says her photo was published in violation of her agreement with the magazine, which she claims had promised to cover most of her body with the ISI initials. Now those are our leads, and for more on these stories, you can visit stream.aljazeera.com forward slash leads, cast your vote for the stories, and uh, if you want to know more about them, we may very well cover them in an upcoming show. Imran? Thanks, Ahmed. Thanks, Mo. And Jesse Ventura still standing by as well. Join us online in the post show with more of Jesse Ventura. That's at stream.aljazeera.com. Go there for about 10 minutes or so of more discussion. On the next show, why some Muslim students are opting out of science classes that teach evolution. We'll tell you all about that when you join us tomorrow. We'll see you next time.
Welcome back to the post show on stream.aljazeera.com. As always, and I always say, so much to say, so little time. Mo, you wanted to make a point? I the lost. <laughs> I was trying to remember it. It was all I had to do with the, um, yeah. you know, with the corporations constantly just, you know, I, I'm just sick of it. People are sick of the corporations owning America, and right. it doesn't belong to the people anymore. Mm. Yeah, it's, interestingly, uh, Jesse Ventura's back as well. He's, he's up there. You can see him in the plasma screen. Uh, we've had these Wall Street revelations very recently, uh, Jesse. Uh, Bloomberg, through the Freedom of Information Act, managed to get hold of some documents which showed that the actual bailout in 2008-2009 wasn't really $700 billion. It was actually $7.7 .7 trillion. There was also um, some documents showing that Henry Paulson had tipped off some Wall Street hedge fund managers that... Um, Freddie Mac and, and Fannie Mae were going to be nationalized by the government, which once again just kind of vindicates this criticism uh, that the, government's e e the government is perhaps in bed with, with Wall Street. I, I want to know, I mean, I, despite the fact that you have Occupy Wall Street, despite the fact that you have Occupy DC, Occupy Minneapolis, uh, all sorts of places, do you perhaps feel that there still isn't enough outrage at this sort of thing that's oh. taken place? There, there, it's not nearly a, a, the outrage it should be. People should be up in arms over this. I mean, in this country, I work, if I work a five-day work week, more than two days of my pay goes to the government. And how they spend that money, I have every right to know what they're doing with the fruits of my labor. And when they're selling out, when you got two parties that sell out, and a, a dark day in America was the day our Supreme Court ruled mm. that a corporation has the same rights as an individual. Well, Especially. what does that mean now? Corporations are going to be able to vote too? Yeah, no, it's absolutely disgusting. It's I outrageous. Mean, it's absolutely outrageous. So I just want to put a quick question. Why do you think people aren't out, outraged enough? What's preventing well, them from you being know, more outraged? I, I la well, I laughingly, but it has some serious to it. I tell people it's because everyone's drinking the water here. Yeah. No, yeah. you know why? Water in America is all fluoridated. The government in the 50s said that we needed our teeth protected, so they put fluoride in the water, and it's been in there for 50 years now. Unfortunately for me, I've always lived my family where there's been well water. So I haven't drank the fluoridation. Mm -hmm. What people need to understand is this. Fluoride was first introduced in the water by the Nazis. And we picked it up in the 50s when we brought them all here with Operation Paperclip. They started teaching us about what they did. Mm -hmm. Fluoride is the major ingredient in Prozac. Mm -hmm. So when you're drinking fluoridated water, you might as well be drinking liquid Prozac because oh. it's 90-something I, I percent it was good for my teeth. I thought it was good for my teeth, but I'm, I'm going to well, look into this I, uh, independently, uh, Jesse. You, Mo, Mo, just a I second. Thought, I want, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm no, sorry. I, I, want, uh, I want Jesse to revisit 9-11 with us because yeah. um, it's not entirely clear what your position on this is. And, and there's a tweet that's, that came in from Jack Hutton which says, Ask Jesse Ventura to elaborate on his Cheney 9-11 theories and should Bush Cheney be tried as war criminals. Um, I wonder, Jesse, I mean, you're calling for a reinvestigation into 9-11. Does that necessarily mean that you believe that Bush Cheney and others actually orchestrated 9-11? Well, let's talk about history that happened that the day before. The day before 9-11, um, Donald Rumsfeld held a press conference where he stated that like $2.3 trillion in the Pentagon could not be accounted for. What happened the next day? Well, everyone focuses in on the towers more than they do the Pentagon. Where the Pentagon got hit was right where all that information was supposed to be. And from that day forth, you never heard a word about the lost money, the 2.3 or whatever it was, trillion dollars that Rumsfeld announced the day before 9-11. Also, I was told this, and I can't recollect it clearly, but they said on 
9-12, the day after 9-11, there was supposed to be a major report on the fraud of the election in Florida that put Bush into office, but it was squashed immediately because, of course, we had been attacked and we couldn't be questioning at that point who our president but, but should Jesse really be, Jesse could we? wouldn't a conspiracy of that magnitude involve <laughs> tens of thousands of people, and in 10 years there have been zero leaks. Isn't it quite an implausibility <sighs> that nothing's come out? Who, who, is, who is going to admit mm -hmm. to taking part in a mass murder? And if it's so implausible to believe the, car, the compartmentalization of government does not require that amount of people to know everything. Government is so compartmentalized, the left hand don't know what the right's doing. And let's look at the Manhattan Project. Over 100,000 people knew about the creation of the atomic bomb, but nobody found out about it until they dropped it, did they? That's a fair point. Jesse, on the issue of uh, conspiracy, some people might take issue with your fluoride theory about, you know, it being in the water and the water being the reason more people in the U.S. aren't outraged, but I just wanted to point out in the Irish Times in Ireland. Well, I do that funny. No, 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 wait, just one second. We have an article today. Uh, this is the headline. It says, Psychiatrists call for lithium to be added to the water in Ireland to counter suicide rates and depression and amongst the general population. So perhaps, perhaps there's uh, that somehow validates your theory. Well, lithium in the water now? <laughs> no, yeah. Lithium? I mean... Come on. Well, that must be why they're in Afghanistan then, because they found a vein of lithium there I read a year ago that could be worth a trillion dollars. And what do we use it for? Every cell phone, every computer and soon to be electric cars. Mm. I, mean, I think when you said that the people are drinking the water here in the States, that has a double meaning, obviously. <laughs> to me, I feel, I, feel, I feel that, you know, the States, people are just denying the situation. OK, my government, no way they can be doing this. Oh, my God. You know, just people are just constantly, you know what? Let's just live this life. It's a fast paced life. And it's just it's about working really hard, never having time for family, eating fast food. You know, that's that's what it feels like. And when you go overseas, you go to it's, Europe and different parts of the world. It's so much, you know, it's so much more different. In France, they take three hours uh, break for lunch. You can, it feels like they're never open. You know, they're always taking time out for family. It, it's a, it's a, just a different experience. It's a different life. It's also, it's also about false flag operations. If you look at history, just about every war is started with, which, with what's called a false flag operation, where a country does something to themselves in which to get the general populace up to support the war. Mm -hmm. It happened in Germany with the Rukstag fire, where they blamed it on the Russians when it turned out the Nazis lit their own congressional building up mm. to get the German people to fight. It happened for us in Vietnam with the Gulf of Tonkin incident. I was teaching at Harvard when McNamara came through and admitted it never happened. False flag operations are standard operating procedures to get you into war. And people need to read about that and understand that because history is now repeating itself within decades, not lifetimes. Can I, can I ask you a question, Jesse? What do you say to those people that, uh, you know, that, that would say that there's a conspiracy out there that says that the United States actually orchestrated 9-11 so they would have an excuse to implement military force in the Middle East or anywhere else around the world, not, or specifically 9-11? <laughs> Not, not just military force in the Middle East. Let's talk about military force right inside the United States. Sure. John McCain and Levin have that bill, 1768, in the defense bill that's going to declare the United States a battlefield, which mm. means the U.S. military will be operational inside our own country. That totally goes against the Constitution. I actually, so I, I, thought I, I thought I heard a drone buzzing above your studio there, but yes. you know, that might just have been in, in my head. No, just kidding. <laughs> Continue, Jesse. No, but the point of the matter is 9-11 could have done so many things for, you know, it also got people rich. Look mm. at how Halliburton, it's yeah. Dick Cheney's old company, yeah. how they've profited from these wars beyond yeah. belief. Look at when I went and investigated the Gulf oil spill. Mm -hmm. They found Halliburton culpable for building that oil rig substantially that it would fail. Well, you know what we found out? 
Three weeks before the failure of that oil rig, the largest company in America that cleaned up oil spills was a company called Boots and Coots out of Houston, Texas. Three yeah. weeks before the spill happened, Halliburton bought them out. So that's called disaster capitalism. They create the disaster and then get paid to clean it up. Wow. Jesse, you've said, um, uh, particularly in response to the judge throwing out your, your, your case against the TSA, you've said that you've lost your patriotism. And you've also said that you are either, you're going to do one of, one of two things. You're going to go to Mexico and apply for citizenship. I already am in Mexico. Uh, you're going to apply for citizenship <laughs> in Mexico. Um, or you're going to run for president of the U.S. Which ones are most likely? Well, most likely a citizenship in Mexico because I already live half the year down there. And when I say that, it's a double-edged sword because... It's not just because I'm angry at the United States. I've chose to live half the year there. If you've ever lived in Minnesota as long as I have, I don't like the weather. I don't like snow. I'd rather be on the beach. Yeah. Now, having said that, it's also beneficial to be a... Uh, it's not that I'm giving up my U.S. citizenship. I would never do that. It's to have dual citizenship. When, I cro when you cross the border potentially as many times as I do, it's far better to be a citizen of both countries. Plus, there's certain benefits you get in Mexico in land owning in being a citizen. So, you know, there's other reasons for it rather than just simply I'm saying enough of the United States. I just have to do something to make my point known. And sometimes you have to say provocative things or no one will listen. Absolutely. Okay, Jesse Ventura, it's been a great pleasure having you on the program. Nice to hear your thoughts. I hope you uh, enjoyed the format. We do things a little bit differently here on the stream. And uh, I hope uh, we get to speak to you in the not too distant future again. Well, let me say this. It's always a pleasure to talk on Al Jazeera. I look forward to it because you're not soundbite news. You're truly out there trying to give information to people, and that's what the news is supposed to be. It's not supposed to be to make money off it. Well, ironically, somebody's going to probably make a soundbite out of yes. what you just said there, and we're going to probably use it as a promo. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse Ventura, thanks for that. Mo, thanks for joining Thank us. You. Thank you for having me. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank Pleasure. you. Great. Ahmed, uh, tomorrow we're talking Darwinism, evolution, and uh, the Muslim world. Yes, perhaps why, why Muslims are, are not down with Darwinism. Yeah, mm. Darwinism. Some Darwinism. Most are. Yeah. I think. I some are. Look forward to we'll it. We'll find out. We'll find out. Thanks for joining us, Mo. Thank Ahmed. you. And we'll see you as well tomorrow. Uh, if you want to watch a rerun of this, it'll be posted in about two hours or so. Thanks for watching.